uh, Claudia Murgan, the host of the Spiritual Inspire show. And uh, my guest uh, today is uh, Brie Greenberg Benjamin. She is the founder of the Vermont Center for Integrative Therapy, opened in 2010. Uh, the center is one of the first mental health centers to combine ancient systems of healing interwoven with current cutting edge systems of care. Utilizing her decades of experience as a psychotherapist, also trained in healing and spiritual practices, Brie created a unique four phase model of understanding and care delivery through which she birthed protocols for eating disorders, trauma, and mood disorders, among other uh, diagnoses. Brie has lectured and presented extensively at institutions, conferences, and universities on topics on integrative medicine, eating disorders, and addictions. She has trained and supervised over 150 practitioners from disciplines ranging from internal medicine to yoga therapy. She currently leads a small team in the service of creating and delivering cutting edge clinical programs and professional training that change how we view and deliver care. Out of a deep desire to change the paradigm of mental health treatment, Brie continues to teach, write and train in the areas of somatics, eating disorders, spirituality, addiction and trauma. Brie, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I feel excited when you read my bio. I'm like, oh, she sounds really good. <laughs> so I'm super excited to be here and to meet you and to talk with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So during the introduction, I uh, mentioned um, yoga a lot. So it looks like yoga plays a fundamental role in your life and in the programs you develop. How did you get into it? Yeah, that's an interesting journey. I um. I would say yoga played a really predominant role in my life and in all of the healing systems that I created for a very long time. Um, it was really the primary somatic method that I originated my work with understanding and using the body in an alchemical way. Um, since then, I have understood that there's different practices that also do similar kinds of things, some aimed at liberation like yoga is, and some that are not. Um, but my practice of yoga actually started because I had a health crisis in my 20s, and I was unable to find anybody who could understand, diagnose, or treat what was going on. And I found myself in a yoga studio and so I practiced many times a week. I had never known anything about yoga, nor had ever gone to yoga. And I found that there was something powerful happening for me. And even though it wasn't healing or fixing what was going on for me at the time, it was bringing aspects of me forward again that were unknown to me. Um, and then I, I got trained and studied the system and began to understand that yoga was really intended for use as a healing modality. And so at the center, we used yoga the way that it is more traditionally used, which is that it's more diagnostically specific and used as kind of a medicine rather than just a catch-all of like, let's go to yoga and see if it does some good kind of thing. So I yes. deeply respect the tradition. Yes, and, and then you also are a believer into a holistic perspective of, you know, mind, body, spirit, emotion, balance. And to me, uh, and to you, and to many like us, this is uh, common sense. We have to watch what we eat. Uh, we have to keep our mind free of negative thoughts and less psychic pollution, and also be emotionally balanced. But still, the, the medical field and the, um, the religion structure don't like to, to look into a uh, human being in, in these terms. What do you think we have to do and change in order to change their mindset? Oh my goodness. I mean, I think that fundamentally you're talking about two different frameworks for relating. So in the framework for relating that you began with, you know, you're talking about practices of hygiene, whatever they are, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual practices of hygiene. Um, that are aligned with understanding that keeping your body and your mind in a particular way allows for spirit to be suffusing your life. And in the other, I think it is a more, it's not so interested in that. It's more interested in a more hierarchical 
structure that utilizes somebody or something in order for some people to get ahead or some things to get ahead. So those frameworks, they don't even dance together. And I think that that's already something to start the conversation that is important, which is that we often think that like I'm sitting across from somebody who will have a similar relational base than I do. And so understanding that some people may have very different relational bases is fundamentally important to begin with. And then I think the next piece is that when you try to create bridges, you have to do it where you're understanding where that person is coming from and understanding that where they're coming from is a compendium of many different things that have made them believe, understand, and behave that way. And <clears throat> many of those things are forces that are much larger than the personal ones and ones that we're all kind of steeped in. And so I think that if you approach somebody as not a person, but understanding that they're a collective and that you also are a collective, there tends to be then more space for investigation and possibility to see where there's alignment and where there isn't. I also think that you can appeal to the places where we all are aware that what we have right now is not working. And there was a time when I opened the center in 2010, when I spoke about this, I had a lot of people who thought I was crazy. And at that time, the system still very much appeared to be working. I think now pre-COVID and particularly post-COVID, there's very few people that don't acknowledge that these systems are not working. They're like not working for anyone. And so whenever that's the case, there's an opening that's present for more possibility and information to flow in and to be received and new creative opportunities to be sourced in a way that <clears throat> most people are closed when things feel fine. Yes, and also in my opinion, I think it's a matter of control and uh, creating a intermediary uh, <clears throat> which won't allow us to, to search that type of information on our own or will try to forbid that type of, uh, forbid us from looking for that information. We have to go back to that authority, either medical or religious, in order to get what we, we need. But again, most of the time, what we get in return is not what we need, is what the perception of those people and individuals and entities thinking that this is what you need. I'm telling you what you need. They have to listen to me. Yes, and I mean, what you're speaking of too is how deeply we have been entrained to give our power over to something or someone outside of us. And that that power is really our authority to understand and be connected so deeply with ourselves that we can feel what is right and what isn't right for us. And if that's been gone for a very long time, then we have these dependent relationships with many different systems and organizations. And then we always feel helpless and that helplessness keeps us in this cycle of dependency with those things, which they then feed on. They count on that being true. And so I've taught about dependency and addiction for a very long time. And people are often surprised when in that conversation I say there's no one in westernized society that is free from that because we've all, we've all been kind of indoctrinated in this hierarchical system that says somebody else has the authority to tell us or show us or they're better than us or whatever and we are truly addicted to that structure that feels safe. And this idea of finding safety in that keeps us in that over and over again, many times unbeknownst to us in very, very subtle ways. So when somebody like me comes along and says no to that, there's a lot of backlash, like from all different levels of that, the system and people who participate in the system, because weirdly enough, the idea of having our own power feels incredibly threatening, which is nuts, but is true. And people really don't want to get this type of power <clears throat> back. Uh, yeah. They are afraid to to act on this power. And yes. during the last two years, we see we saw very clearly how these organizations don't work um, in our 
favor in, in, in our um, uh, to protect ourselves, but against us because the interests rely way beyond this type of structures, go beyond um, their leadership, uh, and it, they are all connected to various interests. And in the end, it's all about money and profit. Yes, and to me, that that expose of that over the last couple of years feels so important on a large scale, even though there's many people in this country that still deny that that's the case. And worldwide, there are also many who have seen that in the way that you just named. And that feels imperative in order to innovate what we currently have and make changes. Yes, because most of these organizations, like medical organizations, in a way have been created the support of the, let's say, pharma industry or that type of uh, background companies. Uh, and of course, when you fund these type of organizations, they have to sing your same song, your, your, your own melody. Otherwise, they will replace the leadership and put in place someone else. Yes, and, yes, because uh, they're not driven towards individuation. They're not driven yeah. towards liberation. It's the opposite. They're driven towards enslavement. And we don't like to use that word, but that's actually what it is. And, and I was amazed to see and uh, puzzled to see doctors, close friends, um, who are threatened by uh, the organizations they're part of, or they're a member of, um, the moment they suggested to their patients to boost their immune system. I mean, that's common sense in a normal world. Why would you threaten a doctor or a nutritionist for this basic, uh, recommending these basic things? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, and again, going back to your own uh, specialty field, uh, you know, in my, I had a handful of uh, guests with, uh, which dealt with the mental trauma and uh, witnessed how ill prepared the, the medical system is to address such uh, energy imbalance. How do you think these issues can, can be fixed? Is the schooling process one, one of the causes? So I think there's, that's a deep answer um, because right now our medical system is largely driven by reimbursement and payer systems. And so the kind of care that's offered and the way it's offered is largely driven by insurance companies. And so already, if that's the case, its, it's aim is not around resolution or healing. It, it may be about management of symptoms or getting people like well so that they're off of that train and they don't have to be paid for anymore. But I think that forever, and particularly now in a state of as much globalization and interconnection as we all live in, the complexity of our systems is tremendous, probably more than ever before. And I mean our individual familial and community systems. Everybody is experiencing challenge in those spaces all at once. And so when I look at the current system, what it does is barely scratch the surface of addressing or being able to reach people at the depth of what is causing that complexity of symptoms. And so better screening would be helpful, but we still have a fractured system where, you know, a doctor may be here, a psychologist is here, a nutritionist is here. They don't cooperate, they don't understand or have a shared language. They, they don't have a relational framework for talking to each other, none of those things. And so everything is in these fractals and then people are already in these fractals and we expect a system that is in fractals and driven by greed to meet a person who's in crisis in fractals without any kind of holding space or clarity of aim or landscape or breath or depth of the issues and how they present. It just feels like we have something that is for kindergartners and we're like in grad school with this stuff. And so people often say to me that I criticize the system and I don't criticize the system. I just look at what it is presenting and where the holes are. And what I say is that what we have is not all bad but it is like telling this tiny part of the story. 
And if you tell this tiny part of the story to somebody who's got this big story going on, they're not going to get well that way. Um, and I feel like we continue to sell people short by telling them that we're doing the whole story when we're just doing this little thing. And everybody kind of now knows it. And there's a lot of apathy and hopelessness and sadness and lack of trust there because of that. And all of that is awful, but also good because when you get to that state, you kind of demand something else. Yes, and there's a lot of discrepancy uh, between various uh, medical systems in, in various countries. and. You know, one of the best examples is people flying out of uh, U.S. Uh, to, to go to Mexico or to yes. Dominican Republic or to even India. And they have, they go through medical uh, procedures maybe for one quarter of the cost and uh, they are being taken care of very, very well. There yes. are specialized doctors there, the conditions are, are good. Um, and then at the end of the, the treatment, they even, they can afford uh, a trip. To, to stay in, in India for uh, an extended period of time, you know, enjoying um, the sightseeing. So again, US, even Canada, are systems which have to be revamped. Who do you think have to, to take care of this? Who do you think will, be, will have the power and the determination to, to break the, the existing corrupt cycle and bring something new? I think it's going to happen in phases and in pockets. Um, so when I conceptualized disrupting the healthcare system about five years ago and wrote a business plan for that, it was disrupting at these kind of four different areas. So you have to disrupt at the clinical level. You have to put clinical models forward that look very different than the one we currently have. And they have to be non-hierarchical. They have to be cooperative. They have to be collective and they have to have a shared language and methodology for the way that they're working together so that you can take multidisciplinary practitioners and you can or organize them in a way in which they can source root cause or etiology while also helping to anchor and stabilize an existing system that is in crisis. And very little of that is going on. That's usually happening in this very fractured way. So you need clinical models. You need them to be embedded in the current system so that they're available to everybody, not just people with money, but everybody regardless. And they need to appear at a variety of different places. So not just your local clinic, but some in colleges, some in like the workplace. So they need to be across the board so that they're accessible easy and embedded within our society. And then you have to interrupt at the educational level, at med schools, at training places for psychotherapy. You have to have this breadth of understanding be taught to physicians when they are being trained, particularly psychiatrists, um, emergency care doctors. These are often first responders for these kinds of things. So that has to be there, and it's not in place at all now. It's like in little drips. Then you have to interrupt at payer systems. You have to put pressure on legislation for insurance companies to pay for things that are not traditionally considered evidence-based. Things like meditation, things like body work, things like movement therapy and voice therapy, things that we know that in 12 years of me working with over 10,000 patients, I could tell you that the bulk of those people healed because of those things that were not covered by insurance. Because what happens is when those are left out, you are over relying on the people and the practitioners that are covered. And most of the time, they don't have the acumen to do those things, nor should they because that's not where they were trained. And it doesn't matter how good you are as a practitioner or how well trained, you're always going to have limits, which is why a multidisciplinary, very skilled team has the ability to alchemize at a much deeper level. So you need to do those three things. And then the fourth is you have to interrupt at the level of community. And this is because things don't happen in a vacuum. And all of our communities are surrounded by poverty, single parenthood, racial injustice, 
All of these things have to be included. If we think they're separate from our health and our well-being and our health care, we're again dividing things into binaries where they actually are working as more total ecosystems. So to me, this is, this is a beginning plan for actually doing this in those four areas. Yeah, and, and what puzzles me is about the practitioners you just mentioned that I understand that they cannot go into too many directions, but at the same time, they should be aware about yes. alternative uh, methods of healing, and they are not. And they yes. either they are not allowed to talk about them, or they are completely completely ignorant that uh, such method exists. They don't want to look into anything else but their own path. And to yes. me, that's very sad. Yes, 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 yes. Everybody's bandwidth has become so narrow. And the over-reliance on methodology versus creativity has also made that very narrow. You know, we train people to be robots. Like, here's the three methods you can use. Here are the ways you use the, people to go to tr tr continuing education to like learn a new method. I'm like, no, go to a three week silent retreat. Like, go be with yourself. Then you'll like awaken some of your erotic intelligence and your creativity. And then you'll sit with somebody in a relational framework that has reciprocity. Then you can apply a method if it is the right thing. But most practitioners have none of that training or orientation. Yeah, but you know, what's the risk of them going to such a retreat in especially uh, Vipassana, the, the silence one or, you know, uh, medicinal plant, they will wake up to a level yes. where they will be disappointed with the school they just graduated. Yes. And they will want to either give up completely or try to change the system which will be almost impossible and they might go into a you know breakdown and that will be also not good for for their overall health yeah i mean i tend to really lean into the fact that that's true like crisis is absolutely possible in the way that you're suggesting and i also think um you know when i opened the center even back in 2010 there were swaths of practitioners that were hungry for a model in the way that I had created it. And I think that if those are out there, then you wind up with people who wake up and they just, they're, they're magnetically attracted to those things. What's needed really is the backing and the funding to begin seeding those things and pollinating them in various different places so that they are there to receive practitioners who are waking up to a wider way and have a place to go get that training and do that work in a very different way. And what is so amazing to me is that when you work in a system like that as a practitioner, you don't feel as drained. It's just more, it's more sustainable for everybody because everybody is being nourished because nourishment is one of the primary actions of that system which is actually such an action against the patriarchy. It is an action against capitalism. And, you know, we talk about like the patriarchy and capitalism, like they're this thing, but they're really both birthed from this same energetic movement of um, predation. And so sustainability and nourishment really is a rebellion against that level of predation. Yes. And to me, that's the only direction we have to take. Like, we know this other one doesn't work. You know what I mean? Like, we, this is, we don't have a choice. We, we may die trying to do that other method. We may all get annihilated in that way, but then we'll just come back and try it again, maybe on another planet, or I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> but I think that's the yeah. genes we're wearing. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's either going to face the fucking thing or not. Like, this is where we are. Yeah, yeah we, we have to, to face it for sure otherwise. <clears throat> won't uh, end in a, in a positive uh, way. Yes. And the four um, ways or the four um, angles you, you just mentioned earlier, are they part of the, uh, the four phase model of understanding and care uh, delivery you, you created? No. So the four phase model actually is now a seven phase model. Um, so the four phase model really was the model that I created for scaffolding and understanding working with addiction and dependency programming. And what I identified was these four different phases that most clients go through in working with those patterns. And 
<clears throat> usually the system will attend to like the first through third phase essentially. The fourth phase is like a smaller percentage of people that kind of get to that space. But when I started really understanding dependency patterning from a wider lens, I started placing it in a much longer arc of maturation so that it was no longer this standalone thing that somebody or some people had but rather this process that we all go through that is kind of an adolescence in our society that can lead and should lead to a metabolized eldership on the other side of it and that we don't talk about things from like phase four to phase eight which are the more transpersonal deeper development more rooted more integrating phases that are less single me and more relational global not only to each other but to the earth to the energies of the spirit world to everything that exists as it is and so I've now started teaching this more seven or eight phase model when I teach about addictions. So that if you know where the journey is going, then in phase one or two, you have a very different way that you approach what's happening. Do you know what I mean? If you think that the journey of addiction is only going to like withholding from use of substances, you're gonna do something very different when somebody comes in and is struggling at phase one, then you would if you think the journey ends, quote unquote, at like eldership and like this ripening of relationality. That changes everything in the way that you behave, identify, aim, real, everything shifts from there. And so I kind of argue that if you're missing that, you're narrowing things so much for people and you're narrowing yourself when working with individuals as well. Yeah. And in any of your programs, have you tried uh, microdosing or anything in, in particular, uh, which is natural? No, the closest <laughs> we've gone to that really has just been um, working with like microdosing pharmaceuticals, because there was a way that we had a psychiatrist who, you know, some people's systems are so sensitive that um, using a full dose of something is too much and blows them out. So we did try with like compounding pharmacies and microdosing for some folks as a bridge to like be able to go from one state of being to another and have some support. But I have not tried any of those other kinds of things in a more organized way. It's absolutely something I would want to experiment with. Yes, I, I heard that the, the results are quite uh, amazing and uh over a period of several months uh, the results were uh, were visible so yeah, that's yeah. Right. <clears throat> i mean i think that those things are all really valid what scares me about them is that right now we're still using them in a vacuum you know like we're still saying go over here and do this thing and it'll m make these other things better and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't so i'd like to see more integrative work going on with that so there's more like full support yeah Brie, I've heard that uh, in the last two years, the uh, individuals with um, mental health issues doubled or even tripled due to you know, lockdown, living in fear, even family death. Um, have you been able to, to help these uh, individuals? So ironically, I closed my bricks and mortar location in Vermont uh, at the beginning of COVID. And I wound up continuing to keep my website going because the influx of people, even once we closed, was tremendous. And so over the last couple of years, I've continued fielding intakes and referrals, even without a staff, because the, the need is so huge. And I remember at the beginning of COVID, I was being interviewed by somebody and I was voicing my concern about the lockdown on adolescence. Um, and people were really not liking the message that I was saying, because it was very much like, this is gonna be really, really bad. Like we should be thinking about the consequences of this. But everybody was so afraid because of the virus that no one wanted to hear that. And I think now we are just beginning to see the tremendous results on the developmental milestones that have been lost and missed. 
and the tremendous amount of impact on parents who have been home with kids and who have not been able to have their own lives or proper support. And I think we're going to see that really intensify and continue in the next five to 10 years. So I have not done anything formally about it, but I would like to, and I've had some conversations about creating some programs for that. They're so, they can't happen fast enough. Yes, yeah, I, I heard, especially with um, teenagers and uh, university students and those who are uh, away from, from home in a different country, they, they suffer a lot and um, the suicide rate <clears throat> went um, up. Yes. A uh, huge percentage. So that's uh, very sad. These are consequences that, um, you know, politicians and other, <clears throat> other uh, individuals uh, in charge don't take in consideration, unfortunately. No, and I feel like that's the theme for us, is that we're kind of flying blind. Do you know what I mean? Just like, oh, we'll just do this, and then we'll do this. But there's no kind of totality of view going on. And so when you have a totality of view, you understand that everything has a consequence or like a relational impact on another. And that this was just the logical impact that was going to be there, and we're so drastically unprepared for it. Yeah. But I'd like to switch to uh, more personal um, questions, if, if possible. And I'd like to ask you, who are the uh, people who influence your life, and especially on the spiritual path? Uh, my spiritual path has been pretty eclectic. So um, I would say that innately, I have always been driven towards the root of truth as kind of what drives my life um, and my curiosity and my interest. Um, when I first got into yoga, that was the first kind of formal spiritual thing that I did. And I wound up as an Ashtanga yoga practitioner um, because I stumbled into an Ashtanga studio and I loved the regimenting and the intensity of the practice and its ability to really like clear your system in a very rapid way. Um, but I hated the fact that the core teachers were such misogynists in India. And, you know, there were so many reports of like Western women going there and like being harmed that I never went to India, even though I really longed to. I just could not abide that hypocrisy. Although I understood that it was in the framework of the culture, it still just was not okay for me. Um, and then that led to me sitting in the Vipassana tradition for a little over 20 years now. Um, and I had a number of teachers in that tradition. I would say the ones that were most impactful for me were actually my monastic teachers um, because I found myself really drawn to the more strict and traditional avenues of that kind of practice. And then there is one Western teacher named Rodney Smith, who is the head of the Seattle Insight Meditation Society. He's now retired. And of all my years, he was the one person that I felt deeply resonant with. But in that path, you don't really get a teacher. You're kind of just showing up to do the practice and hoping it's going to be okay. And so for a long time, I was able to digest all of that on my own. And then I went on a retreat where I got pretty blown open and it became really challenging to metabolize all that I was exposed to. And that has been the last seven years of me integrating that. Nice. And how did you find the uh, Vipassana retreats, uh, <clears throat> the silent ones, of course, um, helping you? Oh my goodness. I think that I am drawn to silence. So I love stillness and the ability to go somewhere and be undisturbed with myself is deeply appealing to me. Um, I think the simplicity of those spaces and the richness of the practice was very nourishing for me for a very, very long time. Yeah. What is your relationship with God, with, with divine? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I, 
I think that divinity is infused into everything. So to me, I have a more animist viewpoint, which is that everything is vibrating with aliveness and that there's sacredness in all of that exactly as it is. Um, I used to have this relationship that was more like spirituality is out here. And now I find that my spirituality is in seeing a bird fly by and marveling at the elegance and the grace of that and that I get to experience that or being touched by somebody or listening to music or breathing or just I think I've been sensitized so much to living and to dying at this point that all of it just was very alive and potent to me yes and to be honest with you um I don't I don't think I had two uh, guests uh, guests thinking about divinity in uh, similar terms and this diversity is quite fascinating um, and uh, one of my latest guests in fact um, Jamie from uh, Jamie Thornhill uh, the co-founder of Casa Galactica in uh, Peru mentioned that at one point in her life she had nothing she just finished a, a relationship and she had nothing else left and she just started asking questions what should i do now and then she received a message and she said that was from god and yeah. from that moment on i start praying i never prayed I, yeah. I, I, I kind of fake it until i got it right and everything started for her so i think every single one of us has a different path and a different understanding of of god and that as long as we we respect each other and we understand what's the end goal of this existence, um, that will be uh, amazing and we can consider that we had a fulfilled life. Yeah, I mean, the infinity of expressions of, of consciousness and of godliness is just, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's ever perpetuating, yeah. What other interesting projects are you working on these days? Um, so the most interesting project, I think, is this new one, which is called the Possibility Program. And that is this kind of meta framework that I created that uses large systems to alchemize and create conditions for emergent solutions to arise where it feels like there is nothing. So I've been very interested in working with systems, both individual and collective, that seem to be stuck in overlapping double binds. And um, what those double binds are about and how being in them may create opportunities for sparks of insight or emergent phenomena of solutions or paths to come forward. Um, and I think this was born out of my work with addictions, where you often have many angles of double binds holding somebody in a place of sabotage and in a place of imprisonment um, that looks like victimization, but is actually just deeply embedded structures. Um, and so I would love to, and I'm curious about taking this methodology and this way of creating conditions that allow for things that haven't been thought of before to places that are other than the healthcare system, other large structures that might be also in this position. But I haven't gotten there yet. That's a much bigger vision. Yeah, okay, <clears throat> because that was uh, would have been my next uh, question. What, how would you implement this in a practical way, so? I mean, I think it would be coming into an existing organization where they felt like this described their experience and they really wanted to see what could be created with a different framework and a different holding space for the way that they are traditionally moving through things. You know, one of the things that's true for all of us is that we become deeply embedded creatures of habit, even when we don't want to be. And so shaking things up and creating conditions where you are forced to relate to each other and yourself in new ways all of the time will often spark opportunities for paths that don't seem visible otherwise. 
And um, there's a particular kind of joining that happens when that energy starts coming into the room. You know, when emergent energy enters a room with people who have been stuck there is like a life there there's a vibrancy that was formerly absent and to me i'm all about awakening up those dead places with that kind of vibrancy because i think nothing is ever kind of fully dead it's just kind of retired because it thinks there's no hope or something um so that's a place i would like to be playing and i'd be i'd be interested in doing it yeah, because another aspect of uh, our personal health is for us to understand that we can take our health in, in our own hands. Yes. Because everything is energy. And if we know how to manipulate the energy, move the energy in our body, and listen to those guys who already did it, of course, um, we don't have to be on pills all our life. And we yes. can heal ourselves, that's, that's for sure. Yes, I think there's way more capacity for that than we've even begun to give ourselves credit for. And I think some of that is because there's places and people who don't want us to go down that path. And also because we just haven't evolved yet to a place in which that's what the collective is doing. What I know from the center is that when I took a group of 15 practitioners and I put them in the room together and we staffed really challenging cases that felt like there was no hope on multiple layers. What we found was that there was movement possible because the group of us were working collectively with a particular aim for opportunity and possibility in a way that left that very open and called it in essentially. And we're very rarely doing that. We're often just walking around with this rather than with this. Yes, and a similar practice with uh, in, in shamanism where, uh, you know, the shaman will um, uh, call on a person with um, big uh, health issues. That person will stay in the center and everyone else will focus yes. on that person trying to, to heal her or him uh, yeah. through their own energy, bringing the, uh, the, the right spirits around the, the circle. So that's a practice which has been... Uh, in place for maybe thousands of years. Yes, and this deep listening, you know what I mean? This deep, deep listening to each other and to what's happening in that system. The respecting the system's own movement and own timing versus imposing our own ideas about what's right and what isn't right as if there is a right or isn't right. You know what I mean? It is this deep relatedness and respect and humility that to me makes that really makes infinite possibility come to bear. Yes. And something else came to my mind, you know, uh, where you, a place where you have a captured uh, audience is the prison. And also uh, mental health issues are quite rampant there. You know, people went through a lot of um, uh, challenges in their lives. Some of them are gang members, you know. Um, do you think that prison should accept specialists like yourself and have programs, rehabilitation programs, so those individuals can, can come out as changing uh, people. It's funny you say that because about five years ago, prisons were my aim. So that was actually one of the first things that I wrote that I wanted to put. There were four targets and a prison was one of them. Um, I deeply would love to create this in a prison system. The tricky part is that when somebody comes out, they're highly vulnerable. And so you also have to have a really strong structure when those people leave. And we know this. I mean, advanced prison systems already have these kinds of partnership programs that are often with private entities to help people be rehabilitated. But to me, it goes much, much deeper than that. And so to, I think prisons are a perfect incubator for transformation and we're not utilizing it. And not just for people who are in the prison, but for everybody who works there too. Because I'm not thinking this is about the prisoners. This is for the totality of the system. Everybody would be trained, everybody would be participating, everybody would be incubated, and everybody would be followed. It could be amazing, amazing. Yes, because it takes to educate the uh, those uh, overseeing the prisoners to have a nice behavior or a, a educated behavior, a civilized behavior, 
towards yes. the prisoners in order for them to to understand that they are being treated as human beings and uh, respond in uh, in kind. Yeah, and I would say that in those organizations, just like in any organization, you know, you have the same strands of like trauma and addiction living in the people who work there. They shouldn't be left out of this healing opportunity. This isn't just for somebody who's in prison because there's something wrong with them. Everybody is part of this soup. And so to me, the whole thing is an opportunity for tremendous healing. And I think that'd be amazing. Yes, indeed. Brie, we are approaching the end of the, the interview. Any final thoughts? Um, I think my most important thought these days is that we all know that we're at the threshold of something very different. And we may not know what that very different looks like yet, but I think the words of encouragement that keep coming up for me is that when you're the threshold all opportunity is possible and that we should be embracing these other ways of thinking and doing particularly in systems that are as big as the healthcare system where so many people are affected and are in need um, I just think it's a really exciting time as challenging as it is yes indeed thank you very much for for your time Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, to my viewers, thank you for watching, share it, uh, like it. Uh, visit my website to download a free copy of my first book. Um, support me on patreon.com. And until next time, love and gratitude.